Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good night. Uh, welcome to our live uh, webinar on uh, business environment reforms through public-private dialogue, um, lessons learned from the ICR facility, and a new proposal, a new view on how to tackle public-private uh, dialogue. Uh, I am your, your host today. I'm your, your, the moderator of the discussion. My name is Diego Borrero Magana. Uh, I am the technical lead for business environment reform at the ICR facility. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. We have a great uh, audience today. We have more than uh, 90 participants from different corners in the world. So very, we're very glad uh, of this. We have participants from Sudan, from Nigeria, from Tanzania, different uh, different uh, geographies, different time zones. So thank you and welcome you all to be here. We have a great uh, panel session today planned for you, uh, which is going to be about insightful uh, lessons that we have got from ICR facilities uh, projects, which as you, as you may know, uh, focus very much on public-private dialogue. And as I mentioned, a new view a new proposal on how to tackle public pri private dialogue not focusing that much on that letter d of dialogue but putting an emphasis on a new letter which is the r p p d r public private dialogue for results um and uh, just to kick things off i am honored to introduce uh, our first uh, speakers who are going to deliver opening remarks, uh, Johanna Cajuloto, who is um, a policy officer for the for investment climate and the trade uh, at the IMPA directory, the DG IMPA at the, at the European Commission. Uh, Johanna, great to see you. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for having me and thank you for, for being here. As Diego has introduced, uh, I'm Joanna Cajiloeto uh, from the European Commission, and together with my colleague Miguel, who is not here today, we, we manage from the European Commission side the ICR uh, uh, facility. Um, just to say a few words to, to kick off the discussions, I think we have a very passionate panel today and, and very exciting discussions ahead, uh, but just to say a few welcoming words from the, from the Commission side, um, we think that um, private sector development, it, for it to be impactful, for it to, to work, we have to have both the public and the private views uh, present. Uh, we have to have the views from both of the sides uh, represented in the discussion. And at the same time, we see that sometimes uh, it's difficult to actually make sure that both of the sides uh, are heard. And sometimes the, the concerns, uh, especially from the private sector, um, might not be reflected in, in all of the different, uh, different policies. Sometimes this is a challenge. Um, at the same time, if you talk about women, for instance, and women-owned businesses, women entrepreneurs, and the specific concerns that women might have in the private sector, this is even more heightened, uh, the, the case, and the, the voices are even uh, less represented. Um, from the European Commission side, uh, we work on public-private dialogue uh, in different projects, in different ways. We've also had a number of interventions with the ICR facility already. So, so we really welcome today's webinar. We really welcome the idea of all of us uh, being here together, uh, reflecting on what works and what doesn't work in, in public-private dialogue, and, and also looking forward to how us together, how we can be more impactful and each on our own sides and in our respective organizations uh, to uh, be more impactful in public-private dialogues going forward. Um, so without further ado, um, I thank everyone for, for being here, especially our esteemed panelists and, and our partners from the OACPS, uh, and really looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for these uh, insightful uh, introductory points, which are very true in the, this, a, again, uh, what work and what doesn't work. Uh, this is, we're going to talk about, uh, about uh, some of those lessons today. Uh, and now I would like to welcome Junior Lodge, Assistant Secretary General of the Organization of Afri African, Caribbean and Pacific States, OACPS. Uh, Junior, welcome. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Diego. I want to have some of that Colombian coffee because you have so much energy and zeal. Um, so uh, greetings uh, to uh, Joanna and her team, our esteemed uh, partners at the European uh, Commission. Of course, our great friends at uh, that leading the team um, at the ICR facility um, doing human um, work. Uh, to all the representatives of uh, governments and uh, private sector uh, bodies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, it's an honor uh, to just uh, share uh, a couple of opening uh, remarks um, here. We, of course, attach great importance um, to this kind of uh, initiative um, because you are trying to leverage um, both the research and the experience that you have made uh, in terms of uh, private-public um, um, dialogue. We, of course, are very much keen to uh, hear, hear more about the research, the results of the research uh, in terms of uh, delivery or results, um, as you said, uh, uh, Diego. This is important, of course, in a context where most of our countries um, are indeed uh, reliant on, um, on investment, reliant on uh, seeking new opportunities for uh, economic development, um, but also reliant on crafting effective policy uh, framework and mechanisms. And we have had a number of examples um, in OECPS uh, countries, but we are keen not only to propagate um, those examples, but of course, um, to build on them and to learn uh, that much more. And this is in uh, particularly important in terms of, let's say, the uh, the two uh, critical focuses of the uh, program, which is also about women's empowerment and youth empowerment, because these are also tremendous um, opportunities. Uh, it, it bemoans us when we think we are, let's say, those kind of uh, initiatives are seen simply uh, as either virtue signaling um, or, you know, being fancy. Uh, um, uh, no, there is an economic case. Um, as we heard, for example, at a recent conference in Kigali, uh, which suggested that if we were to close the economic, the gender economic uh, gap, we would be adding a 20% to global economy. So it is significant. Um, uh, and not just, and of course, is not to obviate the importance of giving dignity, um, creating greater so social co uh, cohesion, and most importantly, uh, realizing the potential um, of women, and the same applies uh, to uh, to youth, which of course is a dominant force within OECPS um, countries. So, in that uh, context, we are keen to listen, um, uh, to learn, um, and let me just uh, end by saluting uh, ICR facility for this kind of initiative because this is exactly the type of uh, not only energy but initiatives and ideas that we need in terms of uh, propagating and guiding us to seizing opportunities in terms of like uh, private uh, public sector uh, dialogue. So I salute you and uh, indicate that I will be listening keenly. Thank you, Diego. Thank you very much, uh, Junior, uh, for these valuable insights. As you say, uh, learning uh, from the experience uh, is key here. And this is what we try to do with the ICR facility. As all of you uh, know or may know, we implement technical assistance uh, uh, interventions to support the improvement of investment climate with a focus, strong focus on women's economic empowerment, youth and youth economic empowerment uh, and inclusivity. So thank you, uh, Junior. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, I extend this thank you to your organizations, the, the, the European Commissions and the Organization of African Caribbean Pacific States, uh, because you have been at the forefront of um, of uh, this, uh, this topic, public-private dialogue. We have discussed this from the beginning of uh, uh, our ICR facility back in 2019, and uh, you have been extremely supportive. So thank you to uh, our donors, European Commission, the Organization of African Caribbean Pacific States, the, the German Ministry of Cooperation and Development, BNZ, and the British uh, Council. So to now we can move uh, forward to uh, our key 
uh, reports, which are the launch of the key reports, which are just launched, and you can consult them on our on our website. You can also uh, check. I'm sure my colleagues are going to or have already uh, distributed these reports to you. They have. They are just launched. They are just out of the of the knowledge oven, if I may say. Um, so we'll first hear from the authors of the ICR report on lessons learned. Uh, from public-private dialogue interventions. And uh, here we have uh, Alina Prode and uh, Iris Boyce from GFA Consulting Group. Um, Alina uh, Prode is a senior project manager at GFA Consulting Group. She has more than 20 years of experience in international development, uh, working with uh, CEDA, the Canadian uh, International Development Agency. She has been working with the EU and World Bank finance pro projects in different countries, uh, such as uh, with the Romanian government, focusing on institutional capacity building and uh, legislation harmonization. Um, Iris Boyce is a senior consultant with over 15 years of experience in private sector um, uh, development for, for private sector um, growth and international cooperation. She has led projects in Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific, uh, fostering uh, economic growth. And uh, Iris uh, holds a master's from the Free University of uh, Berlin. Um, and she's fluent in several languages, German, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, welcome, Alina. Welcome, Iris. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna. Thank you so much, Junior. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, for having us here today. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here with, with so many, with all of you. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present the ICR report, Business Environment Reforms Through Public-Private Dialogue, Lessons Learned from the ICR Facilities Interventions. Um, it's, it's taken us quite some time to um, to draft the report and, and we're really happy to be here now. Um, the objective of the report essentially is to distill lessons learned and recommendations from the ICR facilities interventions on public-private dialogue. And here the report aims to assist public and private organizations in ACP countries who are either planning or already implementing similar projects. Yeah, so the report seeks to, on the one hand side, highlight, highlight successful outcomes to encourage their replication, um, but also to identify PPD pitfalls and to prevent their recurrence. Um, of course, we will share the ICR facilities experience and success stories, all related to PPD, um, and, and, and raise awareness among public and, and private partners um, about um, specifically the ICR facilities perspective on PPD. Um, also, we hope to stimulate discussions with potential recipients of technical assistance focused on PPD. Um, However, I, I would please like to ask to take note that the report does not aim to provide a comprehensive guide on PPD or um, duplicate existing publications. Instead, um, its focus is on extracting the very specific lessons learned from those ICR interventions that were designed to enhance PPD. Um, you can feel the energy here, and, and like I said, we're very excited, and we would love to discuss the report very much in depth, um, but we're only able to present a few snapshots, um, unfortunately. We, we, we split our presentation into two parts. The first part um, will be the ICR report in a nutshell with uh, a focus on key elements um, of the supported PPD initiatives um, and key lessons learned from the interventions. And then in the second part, we, we will present the very practical and tangible example of the intervention supported to, to the Tanzania Renewable Energy Association, also called TAREA, and the question of how the intervention um, developed PPD 
the champions who drove renewable energy initiatives in Tanzania. Okay, so um, that is our program for, for the next uh, 10 to, to 12 minutes. Uh, let me start with the question of uh, what are key elements of PPD initiatives that the ICR facility supported? Um, as you all know, PPD is a tool or mechanism that enables the creation of channels of communication between the public and private sectors. Uh, Joanne emphasized that also. And um, as such, it can lead to more efficient and impactful collaboration between the two with respect to a shared and defined problem, challenge, or sometimes opportunity. Effective public-private dialogue um, facilitates an exchange of views of both dominant and less dominant stakeholders. It creates an understanding of mutual interests and provides space for co-creating and collaborating on opportunities and proposed reforms. Um, scheduled, consistent and continuous communication um, is key and will assist in understanding the position of government and key private actors when advocating for change. Um, it is um, crucial, crucial that stakeholders right from the beginning do have a clear understanding um, of the PPD process and, and its different steps that will be undertaken as well as their associated timeframes. Um, PPD interventions that were supported by the ICR facility furthermore aimed at um, ensuring a diverse stakeholder representation and a gender sensitive approach, something um, we might talk about more in depth later on if, if time permits. Um, as trust and, and interest, which are key to, to the process, are built through the dialogue. Um, between these often quite diverse stakeholders, then this leads to the creation of higher impact partnership and, and hopefully significant changes um, and improvements in how things are done rather than maintaining the status quo. Um, and because of that, the PPD process is often quite complex and, and requires stakeholders um, to, to view situations from different perspectives, um, thereby enhancing understanding and innovation. And um, one of the key elements of effective PPD is therefore also that those organizations um, that are involved in the process effectively manage and apply lessons learned from the experience gained in the process as such. Yeah, and that is also what we wish to do here today. Alina, I'm um, maybe you you wish to uh, comment on on the last point of the slide um, on uh, leadership and ownership because um, so we were now um, uh, a bit between this um, the end of this slide and the following slide. Um, yeah, so a pleasure from my side as well to, to, to be here, um, um, an impressive um, panel. Um, I'm also um, uh, very happy to, um, to, to see James in person after having read a lot of his documents. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so uh, following the review um, and, and analysis of uh, various PPD focused interventions of the ICR facilities, and I need to say that it's been uh, quite a, uh, um, um, a wide uh, number of, of interventions and we have been really um, working hard to, to focus and extract the essence from all these interventions. Um, a key element that, that we have retained um, is the strengthening of state business relations. Um, and uh, this, this can only be achieved through regular communication and clear terms of engagement um, yet above all, 
an essential aspect is uh, to ensure that um, PPD processes are sufficiently sustained um, and have a clear leadership and ownership. And um, there are varying options as to who should lead and own the PPD process in the ACP region. Africa, uh, the Caribbean and, and the Pacific are vastly different um, regions that face different challenges um, and need um, different solutions. Um, however, constraints in areas such uh, as access to finance and infrastructure, um, employee skills uh, and the investment climate are a common denominator for all. Um, whilst the fully mature private sector may be able to assume the leadership of the PPD processes, in most cases, um, a government-driven PPD process is likely to be more promising in um, most ACP countries. Um, so this is um, something that we have come up uh, to, to um, present uh, following the analysis of very many interventions and discussions with stakeholders. Um, however, whilst we have been long debating the, the leadership and ownership of the PPD process in the ACP region, um, we may have not specifically emphasized or differentiated the hosting of the PPD process. Um, and that just came up uh, to my mind whilst I was preparing my speech for today. Um, whilst both the public and private sector must drive, lead and own the dialogue, um, PPD needs a host institution by the end of the day, which should generally be a government body because um, the government is the one who makes the policy. Um, and uh, the host, in fact, must create the forum where frank discussions and, and knowledge sharing is encouraged, essentially like a neutral space. Uh, for discussion. And um, to give you an example, you know, under the sixth political priority called a new push for European democracy, the European Commission is um, committed uh, to giving Europeans a stronger role in decision making. Um, and its consultation activities include an um, open public consultations. And this is what I want you to uh, specifically emphasize here. Uh, the um, this have your say portal of the European Commission, which uh, is for public consultations and feedback, um, where citizens and business uh, businesses can can share their views on new EU policies and existing laws. Um, so yeah, open public consultations, uh, targeted stakeholder surveys, stakeholder workshops, focus groups, case studies, etc. So now coming back to the, the ACP countries, so in the context of most ACP countries, it is therefore important for governments to take an active role and be genuinely open to change policy as a result of the PPD process. Um, government leadership is, however, not to be interpreted as imposing a certain position. Um, but rather as a means of ensuring legitimacy and uh, enabling and facilitating a particular transformation. Whilst hosted by the government, uh, the PPD remains a consultation process where the private sector is given the opportunity to contribute and substantiate their view. Strong political commitment to willingly and enthusiastically provide leadership uh, for dialogue and a well-organized private sector with strong initiatives, teamwork and entrepreneurial attitude will ensure effective dialogue. Um, whilst the public and private sector should be partners and initiatives should come from both sides, the maturity of the private sector is a key factor uh, in determining whether the latter may be ready to take over the leadership of the PPD process. Um, the ACP countries' private sector voice is often not strong enough in some countries, and its maturity differs considerably from one country to another. Um, however, there are um, initiatives already, they exist, and they should be used as, a, as good examples of how and why the private sector can and should also take a leadership role in the PPD process. I will uh, give the word to Iris for the action plans, please. 
Yes, thanks, Alina, for the for the very elaborate um, explanation. Um, apart from what you've said, it's it's obviously key to to really identify and and mobilize suitable private sector organizations um, that enhance their their participation in national development efforts. And here, um, the ICR facility has uh, successfully supported. PPD strategies for business membership organizations across ACP countries. Um, these strategies were often informed by thorough stakeholder analysis. Um, and then based on the analysis, um, strategies were developed which um, prioritize dialogue objectives and, and ensure coordinated engagement with governments through structured and targeted communication. Um, they were complemented very often by, by action plans um, and pragmatic roadmaps, which uh, support the planning, coordination, implementation, and evaluation of, of critical activities. Um, the experience of the ICR facility really shows that such um, PPD action plans have the potential to facilitate the enforcement of agreements between the government and private sector resulting from um, PPD discussions. And uh, one example which uh, I wish to cite from the publication is the intervention strengthening PPD in, in Cape Verde, in Cabo Verde, aimed at uh, strengthening PPD Utila, uh, aimed at uh, strengthening PPD, whereby um, the intervention utilized a five-step PPD roadmap. Um, and despite the fact that the roadmap was um, not implemented, uh, perhaps exactly as initially planned, it uh, initiated the discussion and, and, and led to the establishment of, of government-driven public-private committees. And these committees then uh, facilitated ongoing dialogue on, on critical topics affecting the private sector, such as taxes, minimum wages, and, and labor law reforms. Um, and by proposing very concrete steps and recommendations, the roadmap served as catalyst for, for inclusive dialogue and policy reforms that directly impacted economic participation particularly for women and for, for, for micro and small and medium-sized um, enterprises. Yeah, action plans, um, action plans um, therefore really were, were critical um, for the success of, of some of those um, PPDs. Um, the other point uh, we have emphasized relates to uh, the champions. Um, in the PPD process. Um, successful PPDs are often led by competent, credible and influential individuals that we call PPD champions. Um, and they uh, are both from the public and private sectors. Um, and they help steer and advance uh, the PPD process. Um, they are the genuine custodians really of the PPD process and identifying suitable individuals to represent the interests of both sectors uh, and ensure that their leadership translates into concrete improvements in the business environment is a process that needs to be carefully administered. Um, PPD champions should be individuals with the interest of the country at heart and uh, who have both the capacity, um, desire and enthusiasm to, to take ownership of the dialogue processes and drive it forward. Um, experience from the ICR facilities intervention suggests that identifying a core group of PPD champions and building up their capacity can enhance the sustainability of PPD processes and create stronger local ownership. And um, specifically through the intervention boosting uh, renewable energy through public-private dialogue in support of the Tanzania Renewable Energy Association, Tarea. Um, a group of uh, six private PPD champions was formed, including two female Tarea members, 
uh, and we'll discuss more on this particular intervention at the end of um, mine and Iris presentation. And um, <clears throat> moving away from singular national arenas, regional policy discussions are another facet of the PPD process that can focus on concrete recommendations to improve the investment climate in a specific region. Um, regional and national dialogues with the private sector on investment constraints and position papers and assessments towards effective implementation have the potential to boost regional economic integration. Um, the harmonization of national PPD frameworks can support the adoption of policies and programs uh, which accelerate PPD processes at regional level. Um, where harmonized regional PPD frameworks exist, regional consultations with an established PPD framework can support the harmonization of legislation at uh, regional le level. Uh, the ICR facility provided tailored support to the West African Economic and Monetary Union, WEMOA, uh, to identify and propose solutions for regulatory, administrative, and institutional bottlenecks of business environments um, through particularly conducting PPDs at the uh, regional and national levels. And um, a framework document were, uh, containing the regional strategy on PPD was delivered to EMOA Commission for implementation. And uh, more details on this specific intervention will be provided by Ms. Kadi um, Ndiaye, the Director of Private Sector in the Western African Economic and Monetary Uni Union Commission a bit later. Yeah, thanks, Alina. We can move to the next slide. I think we have to speed up a bit. Um, um, we were again. We were we were really excited to see and 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 also to show in the publication how um, several PPD initiatives um, can make a change and and can really effectively amplify the voice of the private sector across ACP countries to promote um, inclusive economic growth and sustainable development and. Um, yeah, so with this publication, it's our goal to to advocate um, for effective PPD models that empower the private sector um, and, and promote inclusive growth. Um, and at the si same time, also give give some direction. Um, we aim obviously to, to stimulate increased involvement and, and application of insights uh, gained, gained by us, gained by the stakeholders, um, especially those who are committed to advancing PPD initiatives. Okay, now um, let's have um, a look at, um, at our Tarea intervention a bit more in depth. Yes. And I will yeah. take over from here. Um, okay. So we have decided on this intervention because um, there are more elements um, that may make it um, uh, quite representative. So on one side, um, it's the fact that this this intervention and in this intervention, the PPD process was uh, well co-led um, by the private and um, um, and um, uh, public sectors, but it was more. Uh, the, the private sector took a, a quite an enhanced leadership role um, and we very much appreciated that and at the same time um, this intervention also um, was a genuine example on on um, um, the championship uh, of the PPD process so um, in the context of uh, its mandate, the ICR facility provided technical assistance to TAREA, uh, the, the Tanzania Renewable Energy, Energy Association, and in response to a proposal submitted by the organization focusing on PPD training and support uh, on the preparation of a dialogue between TAREA and um, the um, parastatal organization TANESCO on net metering. Um, so quite quite a, um, um, a specific um, domain. Um, so and Tarea sought for support to promote the installation of grid connected solar PV installations through the application of the country's net metering regulation. Um, and um, although the, the government of Tanzania enacted the electricity net metering rules back in 2018 to support grid connected um, solar uh, photovoltaic system, 
the parastatal organization TANESCO, so Tan, that's the Tanzania Electric Supply Company Limited, had um, not by then uh, still agreed to allow the connections. And Tarea therefore sought for support from the ICR facility to help resolve the non-implementation of um, the net metering scheme um, that was uh, limiting the growth of the solar photovoltaic business. Um, the intervention then supported an engagement process between the private um, sector entity Tarea and several public sector entities, TANESCO, um, the Energy and Water Utilities Regulatory Authority, Evura, um, and the Ministry of Energy. And the support provided focused on the training of a team of Tarea on the skills of preparing and conducting um, PPD and the preparation of a dialogue with TANESCO. Uh, then uh, targeting advisory support was also provided to the Tarea advisory team regarding the dialogue with TANESCO to, to enable private develop, um, developers to connect to the national utility through the net metering scheme. And this included uh, an analysis of um, why the net metering rules may not have been applied and what could be done to address those issues, including technical and political economy analysis. And um, identifying and analyzing the needs and concerns of different stakeholders via stakeholder analysis was considered fundamental for shaping and implementing policy reform. Um, and in addition to mapping amongst Tarea members, it was important to identify those who have links and influence on the PPD engagement um, and those affecting, affected or benefiting from, from net metering or the lack of, of it um, were considered in the PPD stakeholder mapping and thus the stakeholder engagement um, was uh, complete. And um, multiple PPD rounds therefore facilitated to reach an agreement between the public and private sectors on implementing net metering. And both TANESCO and TAREA as key players have reached a common understanding on the importance of net metering and have agreed that um, after addressing some key concerns from TANESCO, which was were raised during the intervention, um, the operationalization will be effected. And uh, at the same time, EVURA, uh, the Energy and Water Utilities Regulatory Authority, expressed its intention and plan to review the electricity net metering rules um, already in the coming financial year. Um, so, and through this intervention, a team of uh, six PPD champions was created, including two female. Um, and whilst this team was initially um, intended only for net metering, um, Tarea have uh, already used the same group for broader renew renewable energy policies post project. And this is because those people are now trained um, in PPD. Um, and specifically, I'd like to, to mention that during the post-implementation monitoring exercise, Tarea have stated, I quote, uh, we are also engaging with, with the Ministry on clean cooking. We used four people from the same group for a meeting with the Minister of Energy last week on clean cooking. Because of the training, the group was able to prepare their inputs better in advance and structure the discussions with the government. So the training gave us capacity to form our arguments. We therefore are now better prepared for P PPD engagement. Um, so um, the setting up of PPD champions teams was therefore a crucial element and the champions felt empowered and, and took a number of autonomous decisions going beyond expectations even. Um, and they are now even helping design the implementation of reforms and are looking at helping TANESCO and other government agencies in the implementation of the net metering rule. A very, very nice example, the TAREA intervention. Perfect, thanks so much. Um, let's, um, let's conclude here. For our and presentation, thank you, Alina. good time, I think we should stop here. Yeah, that's right, Alina and Iris. Thank you very much uh, for this comprehensive uh, overview uh, and congratulations again for this great job. You have been working on this um, 
on this report for several months. I have been a witness of that, and the report resulting is absolutely wonderful in terms of lessons that can be applicable. Uh, and, and I invite the audience to read it. You have the QR codes, you have the links. Uh, and also, please, uh, this is a message to our audience. Feel free to send us questions through the through the chat message. Um, now we'll hear from James Brew. Uh, James Brew about uh, our new toolkit on public-private dialogue for results. James Brew. James um, um, is um, an economic development consultant with ex extensive experience in different uh, regions working on PPD on international development, on private sector development, different uh, uh, regional experiences in Africa, Europe, Middle East, uh, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America. Uh, he's uh, recognized uh, global experts in, in public-private dialogue, and he has been at the forefront uh, developing this concept of public-private dialogue for results, PPDR, uh, which is um, aimed at uh, driving sustainability into this uh, uh, economic development uh, processes, engaging uh, stakeholders from both the public and the private uh, sectors with a focus on results. Uh, James, uh, welcome. Are you there? I cannot see you. Sorry, pardon. Sorry, Diego. There you um, are. <laughs> there I am, and uh, thank you for that very kind and very generous introduction and uh, and how good it is to be here uh, with the panel and uh, to have heard from uh, Joanna and uh, and Junior. Uh, in particular, I think, Joanna, your comment on, on passion uh, earlier on is, uh, is very right, and I think you need to be very passionate to work on something that requires uh, a lot of engagement with essentially people people in the government and the private sector who are deeply passionate about their own countries and the futures of their countries, and in particular through economic development. I think that uh, just as an opening remark, I think we should all agree, uh, in particular given that uh, presentation by Alina and Iris, that the um, this is a strategic issue. This is a matter that fundamentally concerns uh, the future of economies, econ economic growth, depends on the relationship between government and private sector. Our interventions in government, uh, in public-private dialogue, public-private dialogue results, poor results for me, uh, we are visitors to this. We are visitors to, to dialogue frameworks that are ongoing and often very old, very established, but they may be in a particular status uh, that requires uh, more support. Uh, or particular support at a particular time, but but the dialogue itself, the intervention, the framework, uh, actually is uh, something that uh, is fundamental to the economy. It'll exist there. It existed before we arrived, whilst we're there, and when we're gone. The status of that, though, is the important thing that we should always be working on. We're there to support the improvement of the status with the stakeholders. So if we could go to the, the first slide uh, the in this deck, the next slide. Um, so this is the contents. We're just going to, what I've decided to do in this presentation is not go through the toolkit that's available to you online. I'm going to provide the, the fundamentals of the approach to public-private dialogue uh, for results. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the, the, what I've found in recent years, having worked on public-private dialogue for over 20 years and in 30 different countries and all those parts of the world that Diego mentioned, is that in some ways the process or the consideration of it has been diluted into focusing too much on dialogue. High interventions, highly skilled interventions at the level of dialogue can and, and does solve problems. Legacy for that dialogue intervention is what's critical for sustainability. So PPD can be defined in general as a process-driven dialogue between government and private sector stakeholders to promote economic development through reform. In public-private dialogue for results, we believe, or I, you know, I fundamentally believe that the, uh, the dialogue uh, is only one part of what should be measured. It's, only, it's often the end part 
of a of a process that involves the hard and dedicated work of government and private sector stakeholders in particular private sector stakeholders in business membership organizations and government officials from the offices of presidents prime ministers ministers and throughout their departments so very a very clear group of very important stakeholders with a very decided process that delivers outcomes for dialogue if we go to the next slide please so I've divided the public-private dialogue for results uh, approach uh, into two areas of results, institutional results and dialogue results. Too often, uh, practitioners in this field of public-private dialogue in countries, country stakeholders themselves, are, uh, are getting uh, under-recognised and not being appreciated for the actual work they've done at, the, at developing a public-private dialogue where stakeholder trust or stakeholder institutions may be very weak. Emphasizing dialogue outcomes in an emerging market, in a post-conflict country where the dialogue may be nascent, is underestimating the effort that's gone into achieving those dialogue outcomes. And what one ends up promoting is short-termism, low-hanging fruit, uh, tactical level dialogues that don't actually enable economic growth over time. They are quick wins, at best, demonstration impact. So in public-private dialogue for results, we identify the strate inherent strategic need for stakeholder engagement, public-private dialogue in any country, at any stage. So we need to, but to make that work, we need to focus on institutional uh, development, the business membership organization and at the government level, in addition to simultaneously delivering results for dialogue. Because at the end of the day, the private sector will not attend meetings, will not participate in a dialogue process that is not results oriented, that they cannot go back to their, uh, their membership and say, this is what we're achieving. This is why you're paying your subscription. This is the very basis of our sustainability. If they cannot do that, they will not participate. For the government, the same thing. If a government minister comes to a meeting and he or she cannot make a decision uh, because the quality of the dialogue is so poor, they will not attend. This is a fundamental issue of the viability of the dialogue process and of the issue of actually achieving long-term outcomes for bringing stakeholders together. If we could go to the next uh, slide. In the PPDR, we recognize that uh, we're working in a system. The, the system is interdependent of uh, private sector organizations, um, business membership organizations, government ministries, the office of the prime minister, um, of individuals in the private sector um, who may not, uh, Alina picked this up previously uh, in, a, in a chat, uh, it, it, that may not be participating immediately in a public-private dialogue that is tactical, short-term, targeted, but may engage later as the process uh, improves. Uh, it's made up of, um, it, it's inclusive of issues uh, relating to foreign direct investments, inclusive of issues relating to uh, the process around passing legislation or reforming legislation or introducing policy. Uh, uh, it's, it's sensitive to gender. Uh, um, uh, it's flexible in terms of incorporating new stakeholders. But it's a system that requires that the acknowledgement that all parties are interdependent and that its efficiency ultimately depends on how those parties are communicating effectively, passing information, progressing issues, escalating issues to decisions, and ultimately measuring implementation. If we could go to, to the next slide. So I've identified under PPDR four different status levels for public-private dialogue for results. Nascent, uh, emerging, mature, and institutionalized. There can be so nascent, just to to, to make it simplify. It, nascent, uh, one can go into an emerging uh, into a country straight after conflict, for example, uh, in the in within conflict itself, uh, where institutions have been severely damaged. Uh, the trust between government and private sector could be very poor. Uh, I would argue that nascent means it's not there. But it does exist. It is inherent to a society. It's nascent and needs support at that status level to 
engage the partners in a trusted dialogue. Emerging um, discernible elements of public-private dialogue. It has an identifiable process. There is some capacity in the private sector. There are pl platforms for engagement. It, it is an acknowledgement that it, it has a role to play. Mature is, is considerably advanced. Mature is a, a public-private dialogue for results process that has institutions that are able to advocate, able to uh, uh, government institutions are then able to dialogue with the private sector. They understand the process and they're able to, on a very regular, predictable basis, deliver results. Institutionalized, fully developed economies in general have fully institutionalized public-private dialogues. They have very good interaction between uh, sector, across sector, business membership organizations. The government depends on the dialogue. It's not something that's a, a, a favor to the private sector. Uh, done on a whim. No, it's uh, within the government calendar of activities. The private sector and the government celebrate their work together and they get predictable outcomes. It's not to say that at any one time a mature public-private dialogue will not have elements of, of emerging or institutionalised. So, But on balance, it may be mature. An emerging market can have institutionalised process but may, may not be functioning. So there are there are uh, different, as you know, as as will have been recognised in in uh, Alina and Iris's report. Every every PPDR is unique and needs to be treated on the on the on need be give need to need, needs to be given the respect uh, that it deserves as a uh, with its own particular country uh, nuances at, at its particular status and supported as a consequence. Um, if we go to the next slide. So on the spectrum of, uh, uh, of inefficient to efficient, every public-private dialogue uh, for results um, uh, is either inefficient uh, or, or in some way on the spectrum towards efficiency. And so on PPDR, what we aim to do is identify the status uh, if it's a low, if it's a relatively, if it's emerging market or if it's a nascent, we'll see that that status um, is inefficient in terms of the way the uh, PPDR system is working. So the communication flows, the relationships, the process, uh, the ability to monitor, to evaluate, the systems used for uh, monitoring and evaluation will be quite poor. So what we need to move, uh, when we're looking at the status of a public-private dialogue uh, for results is, how do we move from inefficiency to efficiency, what's required? What are the resources required at that particular level of the state? So not to treat each public-private dialogue for results in the same way. Treat them differently depending on where that what their status is, how inefficient or efficient they are, and then apply the correct resources at times. If it's a nascent, obviously more resources towards institutional. If it's emerging or mature, more resources towards dialogue. If we go to the next uh, next slide. So applying so all applying the PPDR approach, it's all interconnected. So mapping the mapping the PPDR system, again, this is where it relates to Alina's earlier comments and Iris's and the report. Um, there is a there is a mapping process for stakeholders. There's also a mapping process for understanding the system. Uh, the system. When you understand the, the system itself, you can also identify the blockages in the system, where they're, in particular where communication uh, may not be working between the parties, often a big issue within PPDR. Um, and, uh, and, and this is something that needs to be adapted constantly because ultimately this sort of work, uh, because it's so dependent on individuals and the, and the market changes, the better you develop, the better a PPDR system is developed, more players and participants will come into it. In particular, for the private sector, let's say it's a nascent or emerging market, uh, may have very few business membership organisations, very little trust in them, in fact. As the system improves, as there are more outcomes derived because of the better relationships, the increase in trust, more business membership organisations should theoretically, at least, emerge, and they need to enter the system. So the the the, the a a uh, chamber of commerce for industry may no longer be... Merci, par exemple. Peut-être euh, ne, ne représente pas très bien les femmes, par exemple. 
Mais et ceci doit faire partie du système constamment. Ceci doit être révisé. That is also essential. So the next slide. So in, in conclusion, uh, we recognize in PPDR that all economies have stakeholder engagement. The highest level of uh, public-private dialogue for results would be the business 20 in the G20. The G20 has a business 20, uh, which is a the highest level of, of uh, business and private sector interaction, uh, perhaps globally. Uh, If they didn't have that, if each of those greater 20 economies didn't have a public-private dialogue for results mechanism, they would introduce one because that's how, how necessary it is. Uh, the difference between a highly advanced economy at that G20 level and an emerging one is the status of the PPDR. It's so important like that, that we don't recognize, that it's not recognized how important it is, that we're working tactically still at supporting uh, public-private dialogue. These are missed uh, opportunity in terms of global economic development. Um, I think those numbers on, on, on gender and women, 20% increase, I think on GDP for, for gender, I think June, you may have referenced before, you could, every economy could have a stimulus to its, to its own GDP growth, provided that the public-private dialogue for results mechanism moved from uh, inefficient towards efficiency. So I believe that we're missing an opportunity in terms of economic development by not strategically recognizing the importance of this work. It's too often left at the program mm -hmm. level and not often enough left at much higher levels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the PPDR, uh, PPDR approach uh, it provides entry points to supporting economic development. So we can start at that level of doing, doing the, uh, the scoping work, looking at the system, looking at the status, That should be legacy work. We should be able to go into any economy, make that evaluation, and then anyone that comes in to support public-private dialogue for results can look at the status, look at the support that's already been analyzed, that's required, look at the work that's been done, and join that work. So to ensure that they're promoting economic development in a consistent way. So that's that's my conclusion. Thank you, thank you, Diego. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James, uh, for this uh, uh, detailed but still concrete presentation. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, let's move forward to our next um, our next panelist, um, uh, Kadi Ndiaye, and I'm going to switch uh, to, to French. Uh, Kadi uh, um, est une, une, notre panéliste, elle vient du, du Sénégal. Elle, euh, elle est la directrice du secteur privé euh, à la Commission de l'Union économique et monétaire du sud-ouest de l'Afrique et qu'elle a rejoint depuis l'année 2010. Euh, on a travaillé euh, très, très, très euh, euh, proche avec... Très closely avec Katie et son équipe en sorte de développer... Privé au niveau euh, sous-régional. Kadi euh, est, euh, est une leader dans, dans, sa, dans sa région, euh, ainsi qu'une une, une par, une forte partenaire de, de la, la facilité ICR depuis, depuis ses, ses débuts. 
bonjour Kadi, est-ce que vous êtes là Bonjour Diego, je suis présente. <rire> bonjour Kadi. Vous, vous m'entendez On vous entend très bien. Juste pour, pour lancer la question, étant donné votre, votre rôle à la commission de l'UMOA, quels sont les, les, les plus grands défis euh, auxquels on se confronte quand on euh, fait face à un processus de dialogue public-privé, pas au niveau national, pas au niveau national mais au niveau multi-pays. Multi euh, J'aimerais avoir votre, votre vue sur ça, ainsi que euh, comment une feuille de route pour le DPP régional telle que celle qu'on a développée conjointement entre ICR et euh, la Commission euh, peut contribuer à harmoniser, à booster ce dialogue euh, au niveau régional. Kadi. Très bien. Je vous remercie, Diego. Euh, je salue donc euh, euh, tous ceux qui m'ont précédé et remercie donc les intervenants pour leur brillante présentation. Euh, donc, comme vous l'avez indiqué, je suis Khaïd Ingaï, donc je suis la directrice du secteur privé au niveau de l'UEMOA. Juste rappel que l'Union économique et monétaire ouest-africaine, c'est comme huit pays, donc le Burkina Faso, le Bénin, la Côte d'Ivoire, la Guinée-Bissau, le Mali, le Niger, le Sénégal et le Togo. Et donc on a pris vraiment plaisir au niveau de la commission à travailler avec la facilité ICR. Euh, avec laquelle, comme vous l'avez indiqué, euh, et nous avons travaillé étroitement à l'élaboration d'une stratégie régionale pour la promotion donc, euh, du DPP. Et vous remerciez, vous particulièrement, Diego, ainsi que Julien M., euh, qui nous ont vraiment... permis euh, d'avoir ce moyen euh, et euh, en notre sens une vision claire euh, qui nous euh, qui se veut euh, euh, avoir euh, au niveau de notre espace communautaire un développement économique et social inclusif donc fondé sur un partenariat efficace équitable et durable entre le public et le privé donc on l'a matérialisé donc par une plateforme régionale de dialogue public privé très structurée euh, qui repose sur deux axes. Euh, on a souhaité d'abord harmoniser le cadre réglementaire de dialogue public-privé, mais également co-construire progressivement une démarche de DPP dans notre espace communautaire. Euh, donc ça, c'est vraiment pour introduire le sujet. Par rapport à votre question sur les plus grands défis que nous avons rencontrés pour favoriser ce, ce DPP efficace dans notre euh, espace, euh, je peux dire que ça inclut plusieurs aspects. Euh, déjà, euh, le défi de, le, de différence de développement entre les DPP, parce qu'on a quand même huit pays impliqués. Il y a aussi le manque de partage d'expérience. Euh, il y a les cadres institutionnels qui étaient donc inadaptés, les ressources tant financières que euh, humaines limitées, les problèmes de coordination, euh, la présence et l'engagement du secteur privé, ainsi que bien évidemment les barrières linguistiques et culturelles. On voit déjà que là, je suis la première, je pense la seule du panel à intervenir donc en français. Sur l'hétérogénéité des, des niveaux de développement de DPP, on a vu qu'au niveau de l'UMOA, il y avait un défi parce que les, les niveaux de développement étaient très variés et que ça rendait difficile la mise en place de cadres donc harmonisés et efficaces, notamment à l'échelle régionale. Il y avait également euh, le manque de partage d'expérience, comme je l'ai dit. Euh, au niveau de l'UMOA, on a justement, ce, 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 cette plateforme régionale a été suscitée euh, le fait qu'on participait donc aux Journées nationales de partenariat au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, on s'est rendu compte que les DPP, euh, par exemple, du, de la Côte d'Ivoire et du Burkina, euh, avaient été vraiment euh, très efficaces, très, euh, on va dire, euh, structurés. Et on s'est dit qu'il fallait stimuler le partage d'expériences, euh, stimuler les bonnes pratiques et les différentes leçons apprises, les diffuser au niveau des, différentes, euh, des différents pays membres de l'UEMOA pour avoir une amélioration collective donc, euh, du dialogue public-privé. Sur la question donc, des cadres institutionnels, euh, inadapté. On a constaté effectivement que certains États membres avaient des cadres institutionnels inexistants ou même euh, donc inadaptés ou même inexistants euh, et que cela entravait l'efficacité et la productivité du dialogue entre le public et le privé. Et ça, c'est un défi donc effectivement important à relever. 
le, le, au niveau du, des, des ressources humaines et des ressources financières, euh, on voit qu'effectivement, on, on s'est rendu compte quand on a fait l'analyse euh, que ça limitait la capacité de nos cadres nationaux de DPP à traiter efficacement les préoccupations euh, et à mettre en œuvre donc, des réformes efficaces. On a euh, vu qu'il y avait effectivement, au niveau interne même des pays, une difficulté à interconnecter les points focaux des différents départements ministériels pour remédier aux problèmes identifiés. Euh, et donc, on a vu que ça, ça, ça ne, les préoccupations ne remontaient pas toujours efficacement euh, au niveau approprié. Donc, ça ralentit forcément le processus de décision euh, et de mise en œuvre des réformes. Le secteur privé, on, on s'est rendu compte que le secteur privé, effectivement, euh, a beaucoup de plaintes, beaucoup de préoccupations, mais n'est pas suffisamment engagé ou représenté dans les processus euh, de DPP. Et ce qui fait que les politiques ou les programmes au niveau donc, euh, public ne peuvent pas refléter pleinement leurs besoins ou leurs priorités. Donc ça, c'était effectivement un défi. Et puis enfin, la, les barrières linguistiques et culturelles euh, qui posent des défis supplémentaires, notamment dans la communication, dans la collaboration entre les différents Lorsqu'on parle euh, du niveau régional, c'est vrai que la langue euh, officielle et principale au niveau de l'UE, c'est le français. Mais on a par exemple un pays tel que la Guinée-Bissau qui parle essentiellement euh, portugais. Euh, le défi de la structuration même du secteur privé est n'est pas à, à occulter parce qu'il est essentiel euh, d'impliquer dans le DPP que les vraies organisations professionnelles, donc de vérifier un certain nombre de points euh, au niveau des, de, de, des organisations, la gouvernance, euh, les services rendus aux adhérents, l'expertise, euh, la participation même au dialogue social. Et ce point renvoie évidemment aussi à la question de la représentativité même des organisations du secteur privé. Il faut prévoir une vérification de leur représentativité réelle euh, de ces organisations du secteur privé associées aux mécanismes de DPP aux différentes échelles. Enfin, il y a le défi de l'inclusivité. Je pense que euh, les premières intervenantes en ont parlé. Il faut prévoir une prise en compte des problématiques spécifiques aux femmes euh, via l'intégration d'organisations professionnelles dédiées au niveau central des DPP, mais aussi des problématiques euh, des jeunes via donc, les subdivisions locales des cadres de DPP. Sur la question relative à la feuille de route, nous, ce qu'on a fait donc avec la, la, conjointement avec euh, la facilité, on a donc élaboré une feuille de route qui joue un rôle crucial dans l'harmonisation du DPP au niveau régional, notamment euh, au niveau de l'UEMOA, parce qu'elle fournit une structure claire et harmonisée pour le DPP dans l'UEMOA. Ça permet de faciliter donc ainsi une meilleure coordination une plus grande efficacité et une intégration régionale renforcée, objet même donc et fondement même de l'UEMOA. La feuille de route que nous avons élaborée propose l'adoption d'une directive qui est un support normatif qui doit être transposé au niveau des législations pays et qui établit un cadre juridique et institutionnel de DPP harmonisé et fonctionnel dans les États membres ainsi qu'au niveau communautaire. Donc, on, on a inclus dans cette feuille de route, et, euh, dans, au niveau de l'axe 1, l'adoption d'un modèle type de cadre national de DPP. C'est un modèle qui sera adapté par chaque État membre en fonction de son contexte institutionnel et politique, tout en respectant des critères d'interopérabilité définis donc par l'UEMOA. On a également souhaité la mise en place d'un forum régional de DPP, qu'on appelle le Ford DPP, merci encore à Julien pour cette appellation, qui va servir de cadre d'animation et de suivi à l'échelle régionale et qui va permettre une coordination efficace entre le niveau national, enfin les niveaux nationaux et le niveau communautaire. Ensuite, dans cette euh, feuille de route, on a inclus un processus de co-construction progressive des cadres de DPP pour avoir une transition en douceur hein, et une montée en puissance des institutions dédiées. Ça comprend l'opérationnalisation des cadres nationaux de DPP, donc ils vont établir au niveau des États membres euh, chaque, chacun va établir leur propre cadre de DPP, mais en assurant une cohérence avec le cadre communautaire. Et puis, bien sûr, il y a une phase de transition qui inclut ces, les, 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 la concertation, l'échange de bonnes pratiques, d'expériences euh, et des ajustements nécessaires. 
Le renforcement de capacité, la feuille de route met en place des programmes de renforcement de capacité pour les plateformes et les acteurs nationaux de DPP afin d'améliorer la disponibilité de l'information, donc en facilitant l'accès à des informations pertinentes et en stimulant le partage d'expériences pour que chacun et chaque État membre apprenne, apprenne donc l'un de l'autre euh, et adopte les meilleures pratiques. Et tout cela, bien sûr, avec un suivi de la commission de l'UMOA. On a également dans la feuille de route euh, souhaité qu'il y ait une mobilisation importante des moyens humains et matériels, tant au niveau communautaire qu'au niveau euh, des États membres. Euh, et cette mobilisation doit être assurée et constante en en, constamment euh, en cohérence avec un calendrier prévisionnel de mise en œuvre de la stratégie qui est adossée à cette stratégie-là. Et puis donc, le dispositif de suivi et évaluation pour assurer que les objectifs de la feuille de route sont atteints, euh, qui inclut des indicateurs de performance qui mesurent l'efficacité des cadres et la satisfaction des opérateurs économiques, mais également les rapports d'études qui sont réalisés tout au long pour évaluer le fonctionnement notamment du forum de DPP et qui suggère donc des améliorations. La plateforme euh, voilà, de, de régionale, donc, euh, à, on a pour, sur la stratégie adossé euh, cette feuille de route-là euh, qui, euh, se, on va dire, se décline euh, suivant ces différents points. Donc voilà, Diego, globalement, ce que je peux dire par rapport à votre première question sur les défis et la feuille de route que nous avons élaborée conjointement avec la facilité. Et c'est encore l'occasion pour moi euh, de vous adresser les, les sincères remerciements de Monsieur le Président de la Commission de l'UEMOI qui a effectivement validé cette stratégie qui devrait être euh, soumise euh, au prochain Conseil des ministres statutaires de l'UEMOI. Merci beaucoup, Kadi. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh... Uh, we have we are very very uh, proud and grateful for to to be part um, together with the UMOA uh, on this uh, process, which uh, it's going quite well. And in my opinion, it's going to become a landmark for for other regions uh, around the world. Thank you so much, uh, Kadi. Uh, now we're we're going to start Merci wrapping up. Uh, Merci, Kadi. Uh, with very, very uh, punctual uh, questions. And I have one question for, for James. Uh, James, PPDR, um, we have mentioned different words, passion, enthusiasm, uh, legacy. <laughs> um, it requires uh, identifying and training PPD champions for this long-term view, this long-term effectiveness. Um, In your experience in, in Cambodia, in other countries, what is the best way to identify and train and build these champions? So my, uh, my approach to this is very much about uh, who, have the, uh, who has the private sector uh, already nominated as their champion. So the primacy of the work has to be within the business membership organizations. There, from the private sector perspective, as I might slightly deviate from Alina here and, and, and Iris in their report, in that I don't, you need to have the process housed both in the government and the private sector. And so your champions are in the government and in the private sector. So uh, I believe that the, the best, um, uh, the future for this kind of work Uh, is actually governance related. So the best governance uh, within an institution, within a private sector institution, will nominate, will elect, uh, will give terms to, will provide guidance as to what uh, the leaders of the business membership organization are meant to do, what their roles and responsibilities are, and then the people within those business membership organizations what their roles are, especially around the advocacy function. So the best leaders, are the ones that within the institutions, government or private sector, are, um, are there either elected in the government or uh, uh, in the private sector uh, elected in the same way, but have a very uh, a clear understanding of the roles and re their roles and responsibilities, and that those roles and responsibilities are then transferable to the next phase of the uh, government or private sector. So. For me, it's cha champions within institutions, but promote the institutions, don't promote the individuals, because we don't want 
public private island for results captured. Thank you, James. Promote institutions, don't promote the individuals. Thank you so much. Uh, this question uh, was, it's, I'm paraphrasing one question from, from our audience from Ekanat. Ekanat, thank you very much for that question. Uh, Alina, and very briefly, in less than, than one minute, the, the um, inclusivity, it's a mantra that we hear uh, all over. And of course, we are for it. Uh, however, it's quite difficult to, to convince some, some uh, governments in PPD, uh, uh, platforms and processes about this. Very briefly, how what what arguments would you use to convince a policymaker on the importance of inclusivity, particularly in gender um, related uh, matters, uh, to a policymaker in a PPD process? Okay, very briefly because um, I know we're short of time. So, in two three compelling arguments, I would say that inclusiveness is a means to ensure enhanced policy effectiveness. Uh, improve stakeholder buy-in and, and long-term stability and growth. So um, with enhanced policy effectiveness, uh, you have inclusive PPD that leads to policies that are more e effective in addressing diverse economic uh, challenges um, and opportunities. And that's because they draw on a wider pool of expertise and experience. Um, then as for an improved stakeholder buy-in, um, you have, um, you involved all the stakeholders from the beginning and this fosters ownership of policies and reforms, leading to smoother implementation and greater compliance. Um, and, and, and then um, inclusivity promotes social cohesion and reduces potential conflicts by ensuring that all groups feel represented and, and their interests are taken into account. Thank you, thank you, uh, Alina. Uh, very briefly also, uh, Kadi, uh, if you're still there, Um, Kali, quels sont, quels sont les avantages de, um, avantages spécifiques de, uh, disons, attaquer certains sujets de DPP au niveau régional plutôt qu'au niveau pays? Oui, Diego, en fait, là, le, je, on m'entend, c'est bon? Oui. D'accord. Alors, en fait, euh, je remets, donc voilà, si vous voulez, quand euh, on a une plateforme régionale de DPP, ça permet d'offrir des solutions plus efficaces que les initiatives nationales euh, en facilitant l'harmonisation des politiques et puis en améliorant euh, le commerce intra-régional, en attirant les investissements, en développant des chaînes de valeur régionales, en gérant certaines crises, euh, en facilitant le dialogue et en améliorant même l'accès au financement. Euh, vous allez avoir, voir que... Euh, les, les disparités entre les cadres réglementaires des différents États membres peuvent créer des obstacles au commerce, au commerce et à l'investissement. Et quand on a une plateforme régionale, ça peut faciliter l'harmonisation des politiques et des règlements à travers les États membres et créer donc un environnement commercial plus cohérent et prévisible pour nos entreprises. Euh, par ailleurs, par ailleurs euh, les barrières techniques et administratives peuvent freiner le, le commerce intra-régional. La plateforme au niveau régional peut permettre de coordonner les efforts pour lever les obstacles techniques au commerce et améliorer donc euh, euh, les, les, la sécurité sanitaire juridique, faciliter donc ainsi le commerce intra-régional. Euh, les investisseurs étrangers également peuvent être découragés par des environnements d'investissement fragmentés, euh, incertains, je dirais. Et quand on présente une région qui est intégrée avec des règles harmonisées et des procédures simplifiées, ça peut rendre notre région plus attractive pour les investissements étrangers et donc c'est plus bénéfique pour l'ensemble des pays euh, donc de notre, de notre sous-région. Euh, sur les chaînes de valeur régionales également, euh, on voit que le développement des chaînes de valeur, c'est souvent entravé par un manque de coordination, d'intégration. Avec une plateforme régionale, on peut promouvoir la collaboration entre les États membres pour développer nos chaînes de valeur et, et qu'elles soient compétitives, ce qui facilite, comme vous le savez, l'industrialisation euh, et la diversification économique. Il y a aussi, quand vous avez, on a passé par exemple par la crise COVID, les crises, les pandémies, les conflits, les, les catastrophes naturelles, ça nécessite souvent une réponse coordonnée euh, au-delà des capacités d'un seul pays. Avec une plateforme régionale, on peut coordonner des réponses euh, régionales efficaces et mobiliser des ressources pour gérer ces crises-là qui affectent donc plusieurs États membres en général. 
sur la partie relative euh, au, au dialogue et à la coopération, le dialogue entre le secteur public et le privé, c'est souvent limité par des contraintes nationales et un manque de coordination régionale. Avec une plateforme au niveau régional, on a un forum, euh, d'ailleurs, qui a été proposé dans la stratégie qu'on a conjointement élaborée, qui est centralisé pour le DPP et qui facilite la coopération et l'échange d'idées et de solutions entre les différents pays et les secteurs. Et enfin, j'avais parlé du financement. Nos PME, on le sait, l'un de leurs principaux problèmes, c'est l'accès au financement. Et avec la plateforme, euh, au niveau régional, on peut promouvoir des initiatives régionales pour améliorer l'accès au financement, avoir par exemple des fonds régionaux de développement, des programmes de soutien aux PME, mais également euh, avoir euh, des, de la réglementation qui euh, est régionale et qui donc s'applique à l'ensemble des pays. Une fois harmonisé, cela facilite l'accès au financement donc pour nos PME. L'efficacité de la plateforme de DPP euh, de l'UMOA va vraiment découler de sa capacité à interagir avec les cadres nationaux et faire remonter les questions qui sont plutôt d'ordre régional. On a d'ailleurs identifié euh, au niveau de cette plateforme des sujets prioritaires en quatre grands domaines. Le premier, c'est le fonctionnement du marché intérieur de l'UEMOA, où on a logé les thèmes euh, tels que les obstacles techniques au commerce, les marchés publics, tout ce qui est normalisation, certification, la sécurité sanitaire, la sécurité juridique et judiciaire. Euh, le deuxième grand thème, c'est la promotion des investissements avec les dispositions incitatives, le financement des économies, l'industrialisation et les chaînes de valeur. On a une troisième thématique forte qui est le, les facteurs de production. On veut agir sur l'énergie, le capital humain, l'innovation. Et enfin, dans le divers, on a logé toutes les questions de fiscalité, euh, d'informel, de l'accès aux fonciers, etc. Donc, ce sont tous des thèmes qui sont de portée et de complexité très diverses, qui supposent donc des évolutions réglementaires et ainsi que des études approfondies euh, qui vont donc et, et il convient à notre sens d'adapter euh, à la fois donc des calendriers de travail des moyens humains et matériels mais au niveau régional donc euh, vous allez voir que euh, c'est important vraiment de trouver un bon équilibre dans le choix des sujets qui vont être opérés au niveau national et ceux qui vont être opérés au niveau euh, régional pour pouvoir avoir justement, euh, on va dire, un plan de charge ambitieux et qui donne lieu à des prises de décisions concrètes. Euh, les choix des thèmes à traiter doivent vraiment autant que possible se faire sur la base d'un consensus et c'est pour cela qu'on a créé ce forum euh, régional du DPP qui va nous permettre donc de sélectionner minutieusement les sujets remontés par les cadres nationaux de DPP au niveau donc régional parce parce que euh, tout simplement leur traitement va dépasser le niveau national sans pour autant euh, concerner l'ensemble des États membres de l'UEMOA. Donc euh, voilà un peu euh, euh, comment nous on, on a essayé de voir comment dissocier les problèmes au niveau national euh, et les problèmes à traiter surtout au niveau régional. Merci Thank you so much. Thank you, Kadi. And thank you to our... <laughs> <laughs> merci, merci. And thank you to all panelists. We have been, we have gone a little bit uh, 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 beyond the scheduled time, but I think it was, uh, it was worth. Thanks a lot for all the panelists to share, not to, uh, to, to, sh to share this, this knowledge, this uh, experience. I want to deeply and from my, from my heart, thank Alina, Iris, uh, James, uh, Caddy, Junior, uh, Johanna for being here today with us. Uh, I want to also reiterate to our audience that the ICR facility provides technical assistance interventions to support these processes, these public-private dialogue processes. And I have one good news and one bad news. The first the bad news is that actually the deadline to, to send us a request is today. <laughs> and, but probably if you follow ICR facility, uh, you are aware of this and you have sent us already a request. The good news is that for those participating in this um, in this session, we're extending this this deadline until tomorrow. So you have uh, 24 hours more. <laughs> it's a very simple um, uh, request form. Uh, if you have something interesting to to propose to us, please send it send it along. Thanks a lot again to our esteemed panelists. Thank you again. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to our audiences. And uh, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you, Diego. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. And thank you all.